Hi everyone. For today's poem, I am going to read Sonnet Number 18 by William Shakespeare. And before everyone groans and runs off to do something else, I implore you to just hang in there with me for a few minutes. This is going to be fine. In fact, hopefully you'll enjoy it and maybe even learn a thing or two. William Shakespeare was born in England in Stratford-upon-Avon. Avon is the name of the river that runs through the town. In 1564, and he died in 1616. He wrote plays, and we're familiar with many of the names of his plays, Romeo and Juliet, Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear, and he sold them to playhouses. This, of course, was hundreds of years before movies or TV or radio, and so the way the people of his day got their entertainment is they went to see live plays. Now, people still do that. However, in 2020, they're not going to live plays because of the pandemic. Interestingly enough, Shakespeare started writing poetry because in the early 1590s, there was a pandemic of his age, not coronavirus, something much worse, uh, the Black Plague, and that forced the playhouses to shut down for a while, so he turned to poetry. The Black Plague had been around off and on for a couple of hundred years. It first hit Europe in the 1300s, and it was devastating. Uh, estimates are it killed somewhere between a third and half the population of Europe in the 1300s. And then it went away and it would come back every you know, couple of dozen years, sometimes really bad, sometimes not so bad. The plague was carried by rats, specifically the fleas that were on rats. And so people got so they could kind of predict when the plague was going to come back because if there was a mild winter, that meant that not enough rats and fleas would die off and then plague would be back in the spring. And that happened. Uh, there was a mild winter in 1592 to 93. And so in the spring of 1593, it was back and it shut down playhouses. So Shakespeare wrote poetry for a while, quite a lot. He wrote 154 sonnets, and sonnets basically are love poems that fit a certain structure. The first 126 sonnets sound like they're being read from a man to a woman, but it is believed that in fact they're designed to be read from a man to another man. Now before you jump to conclusions, this is not necessarily uh, you know, an erotic relationship. This is more of a, a deep friendship, a deep admiration of one man by another. But certainly you could read them man to a woman or in this day and age, the reverse. They fit a certain structure. There are 14 lines in each sonnet and each sonnet is divided into three groups of four lines and then one group of two at the end. Each group of four is called a quatrain, and in each quatrain, line one rhymes with three and two rhymes with four. And then at the end, the couplet, lines 13 and 14, rhyme with each other. When you just read his poetry in a book, sometimes it doesn't seem like they quite rhyme. Well, there's a reason for that, and that's because years ago, Word, certain words were pronounced differently than they are today. It can be tough going at times because he used the words of his day, words like thee and thou and hast that we don't really use today. And he also, by his nature, was always looking for a, a different way of saying something, uh, which sometimes requires some translation. And so in this poem, at one point, he refers to the sun in the sky instead of the sun in the sky. He calls it heaven's eye. That's what made him the, the writer that we know him to be. So what I thought I'd do is I'll read through this and then I'll translate it a bit and then I'll read through it one more time. So here we go. Sonnet 18. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day 
Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. All right, so let's translate that a little bit here. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Shall I compare you to a summer's day? Think of summer's day, you think of warmth and sunshine, so that's a compliment. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. You are lovelier and milder than even a summer's day. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. Rough winds do shake the pretty buds of May. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. And summer doesn't nearly last long enough. Many people agree on that, even today. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines. Sometimes it's too hot outside, even in the summer. And often is his gold complexion dimmed. How can, it, how can the sun's complexion be dimmed? Well, when clouds get in the way. That would make a good song. And every fair from fair sometime declines. When he, when he uses the word fair, he's referring to the word beautiful and a beautiful person. So everything beautiful stops being beautiful eventually. By chance or nature's changing course untrimmed either by accident or simply in the course of nature. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, but your eternal summer will never fade. Nor lose possession of that fair thou owest, nor will you lose possession of your beauty. Nor shall death brow thou, brag thou wanderest in his shade, while in eternal lines to time thou growest. So if for a moment we poetically assign a, a living being to death, we're saying that death is not going to brag once, once he's got you, once you've died, because your beauty is captured in these eternal lines of this poem. Now, it's a rather bold statement for a poet to refer to his own lines as eternal lines, then again, we're reading these lines 400 and some years after he died, and it's a good bet that 400 years from now, people will be reading them. So, uh, for all intents and purposes, they are eternal. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. As long as men are around and they've got the eyes with which to see, this poem will live on because they're going to read it and it will keep your memory and your beauty alive. Wonderful poem. Again, these sonnets fit a very certain structure. There's 14 lines, three quatrains and a couplet, but each line is written in what is known as iambic pentameter. And what does that mean? Well, an iam that's spelled I-A-M-B, is a two-syllable beat, like a, like a heartbeat, if you will. Pentameter, penta, five to the meter, means there's five of these heartbeats to a line. And just like a heart has a certain rhythm, these lines are supposed to have a certain rhythm. And so there's a slight emphasis on the second syllable, slightly more than the first syllable. So it follows a sort of a heartbeat rhythm, to dum, to dum, to dum, to dum, to dum. So when I'm reading the first line, I don't say, shall I compare thee? I say, shall I compare thee? The way it's meant to be written. It also means that there are exactly 10 syllables in each line. And when I first ran across that, I thought, that can't be that this, all this beautiful poetry, in addition to fitting into exactly 14 lines and one rhymes with three and two with four, 
that there are exactly 10 syllables in each line. So let's try that real quick. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? 10. Thou art more lovely and more temperate. 10. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. 10. Let's do the last two lines. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see. 10. So long lives this and this gives life to thee. 10. So now once you realize all of that, that there's 14 lines to every sonnet and one rhymes with three and two with four, and then you realize that there are exactly 10 syllables to each line and that those are divided into five heartbeats and in each beat the second syllables should be accented a little bit more than the first, you realize just how incredibly brilliant Shakespeare was as a writer to make this all work. And, and so that appreciation makes his writing even that more fascinating. Well, to me anyway. So let's, with all that in mind, let's just read through this one more time. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's lease hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance, or nature's changing course, untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade, nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe, or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee.